Hey everyone, uh, Dr. Jake Gordy, and in the previous video, I went sort of through the structure and function of bacteria, but I didn't really explain how did bacteria actually cause disease. And that's the whole point of this video series, the cellular basis of disease. How did these bacteria actually cause the disease? So let's just jump into it. These images here are some histology sections, and we can see invading bacteria into these tissues. And so let's figure out how are these bacteria actually causing disease? So there's going to be a lot of jargon in, in this video, so it's a bit of a jargon alert, but let's just jump into it. And you kind of need to learn these terms so you can speak the language of microbiology. So unfortunately, you just sort of have to learn these terms. So the first up is heterotroph. Um, heter heterotroph are a group of organisms that derive their energy from organic molecules. We're heterotrophs because we eat plants and animals and that gives us the energy to survive. Now the opposite of that is an autotroph which derives their energy either from the sun or the volcanic vents. Now the origin of these terms is hetero means different and so we eat other things, we eat other organisms, different organisms, dead different organisms or alive different organisms but organic molecules produced by other organisms we eat that for our food auto means self so autotrophs are self-sufficient um, and so they can derive energy from the sun just like plants right so we're heterotrophs and here's another term parasite is an organism that lives in or on a host species and benefits by deriving nutrients at the host expense. And this is really the crux of why bacteria cause disease, because disease-causing bacteria are heterotrophic parasites who are essentially eating us, right? They are living on us or in us, and they're deriving their nutrients from us. So they're essentially eating it. And here we can see a lesion of Staphylococcus aureus, um, on, on a child's face here, and you can almost see that the bacteria is eating that child's face, which is horrific. So um, there are several different ways to break up these heterotrophic parasites um, that are called bacteria, disease-causing bacteria. There are obligate pathogens, and they are obligatory. They must be pathogens. If they are in you, they are trying to be pathogens. Only if they can do a successful infection do they become a pathogen, but they are they must be a pathogen in order for their life cycle to go. Now, it can just occur in part of their life cycle, not necessarily all of their life cycle, but at some point, they require a host to derive their nutrients from. So they are obligate pathogens or parasites. We typically call bacteria pathogens, even though they are parasites, and pathogens just means um, a generator of path, and path means disease, so a generator of disease, so pathogen. Then there are opportunistic pathogens. So these guys aren't always pathogens, but if they see the opportunity, they'll become a pathogen. What do we mean by opportunity? Well, someone with a suppressed immune system can often be infected by opportunistic pathogens. So if you have a suppressed immune system, it's suddenly very easy for a, uh, an organism to infect you. So it will, even though it doesn't have to, it will <laughs> and cause a pathogen. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so uh, that's an opportunistic pathogen. And so it will just do it if it can. So an example of immune compromised is HIV. Uh, people with HIV, this is a disease, a virus disease that kills your immune system. And so you are now open to opportunistic pathogens. Another way opportunistic pathogens work is that they require a whole bunch of them to get together and start to work. So um, if, the, if you've just got a nice level in your body, then that's probably a good thing. Um, and But if you have too many, then that's a dysbiosis, um, a bad balance of your bacteria in your body. Um, and so that can cause disease. So these can be broken up again into symbiotic bacteria. Now symbiotic, remember we saw that before um, in the formation of eukaryotic cells um, hundreds of millions of years ago um, when that uh, parasitic archaea ate that protobacteria and we ended up with endosymbiosis. So symbiotic means um, both benefit, right? We both gain. Rather than a parasitic where one gains, one loses, a symbiotic relationship is where we both gain. Now, an example there is E. coli. So E. coli lives in your gut. 
It's supposed to be there. It's a normal bacteria. In effect, it produces a vitamin for you called vitamin K. Um, Staphylococcus aureus, this is a little bit more debatable, but it is often on your skin and in your lungs. And there is some evidence that it can actually help prevent worse lung diseases. So it will only infect you if the opportune if, it, if the opportune moment occurs. And so that's why E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus are opportunistic pathogens. Um, another one is sort of environmental microbes. So these aren't living on you or in you normally. They're normally out um, doing other things. And then they see an immune compromised individual or the appropriate opportunity to infect you. And an example for this is a baker's yeast. Baker's yeast, we're going to study this a little bit later, but that's right, the yeast that we use for um bread and even the yeast that we use for wine or beer can infect you if you're immune compromised so it's an opportunistic pathogen rather than an obligate pathogen so let's go through an obligate pathogen and hopefully you can see in this life cycle it is obligatory that it's a pathogen and the example i'm going to use is chlamydia so here we have a chlamydia now um, a, cl a chlamydia bacterial cell. Now, because it is outside of the human body or outside of a human cell, it's in this, it's, I've colored it in gray because it's in a dormant state. When, when it's outside of a human cell, it becomes dormant. It, there's not a lot of metabolism going on. There's not even a lot of fluid in there. Um, it becomes a very highly concentrated, um, fat full of proteins um, and lipids. Um, bacteria, but it becomes, it, it basically shrinks, pumps out all the water, and it becomes metabolically inert. And on its surface, is it's got these key proteins sticking out from um, its cell wall and cell membrane here. These aren't the scale, but it's so we can track what these proteins do in the life cycle. And here's an electron microscope image of uh, one of these dormant chlamydia cells. Now what's going to happen is it's going to find a human cell. Now that protein on the surface is going to bind to a protein on the surface of the human cell. So here we have, for example, a urethra epithelium because chlamydia is a sexually transmitted disease. Um, so it can grab on to this um, uh, protein that is jutting out of this human cell. What it will then do is it will keep grabbing more and more membrane, dragging itself into the cell and it creates a vacuole inside the cell. So those proteins grab more and more receptors and it signals to the cell to envelop it and it ends up inside the cell. Now once it's inside the cell, it reanimates itself. It pumps a bunch of water into it and its metabolism begins to start to kickstart. I say water, but it's ionic water. It's more cytoplasm, right? It pumps a bunch of um, water and ions and everything that we need to begin our metabolism and it fills up like a balloon. Now you might think I'm exaggerating here, but we actually have electron microscope images watching this process happen. Now it just so happened in this image that a bunch of bacteria at different stages in the cycle were all there in the one image. So it's a really beautiful image. So here we can see the dormant bacteria highly concentrated. That's why it's black. Uh, the electrons can't get through it, so it creates a black image there. Um, and we can see it slowly filling up with cytoplasm until it becomes this fully swollen, now metabolically active, almost alive um, uh, uh, bacterial chlamydia cell there. So what happens next? This is smart. This is a super smart thing that has evolved. So the chlamydia uh, bacteria will now start producing proteins. Now these proteins will actually end up facing outwards from the vacuole. So it's produced this protein here and it's now facing outwards from the vacuole. Now what are these proteins? Well, so uh, this requires a bit of a, a review of cell biology, but um, here we have some rough endoplasmic reticulum. It creates proteins. Um, these are ribosomes. The proteins go into the lumen of that endoplasmic reticulum. These bud off into vesicles, and these vesicles often head towards the Golgi, and the Golgi then processes those proteins. So we have a lot of vesicles flying around the cells. The vesicles at the other side of the Golgi might then go and join the membrane. So um, there are in, in every cell, you have vesicles flying around. How do they get around? Well, your cell has a bunch of machinery to traffic and organize these vesicles. Um, going from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi, they have a bunch of trafficking proteins. Now, the chlamydia is hijacking this. It has a receptor on it that matches a receptor that we have, and it, 
it tells the cell to send vesicles to this vacuole here. So the vesicles, instead of going to the Golgi here, are redirected and then bind to the surface of this vacuole. And then they will merge with the vacuole and they will empty their contents into the vacuole, right? So these vesicles are full of protein and the, the chlamydia has basically said, hey, instead of sending that to the Golgi, send that here, yum, yum, yum. And so the chlamydia is now being delivered essentially the cell is now reorganized this machinery to deliver nutrients to its vacuole so now that the nutrients are getting pumped into this vacuole the chlamydia will now start to divide and divide and divide so here we have um, a cell undergoing binary division there to form uh, two cells and this will keep happening and the vacuole will fill up massively with a whole bunch of chlamydia bacterial cells because it's being fed by the host cell so genius once it gets full um, and the cell, the host cell is running out of nutrients and the host cell is beginning to die, chlamydia thinks, okay, now it's time to go into that dormant state because I can't survive outside of the cell. I'm an obligate pathogen. I have to be in here for this part of my life cycle. So it'll start to concentrate up, spit out its cytoplasm, shrinking, shrinking, shrinking into that dormant robust when it's in the state it's very robust it can survive the harsh environments it's metabolically dormant it's a very robust it's almost like a spore but it's not quite technically so it shrinks and shrinks and shrinks into this um, metabolically dormant form in its life cycle and what happens next is it then bursts forth the cell is dead and the chlamydia um, has dehydrated itself and it's in that uh, metabolically dormant state it can now spit out and it will spit out a bunch more of these bacteria and they will now go and infect other things now you can see that life cycle requires a host cell and that's why they're called obligate pathogens now this bacteria is actually called an intracellular bacteria and that's because it has to live inside a cell and so this is another way to divide our bacteria some bacteria are intracellular bacteria and live inside of our cells some are extracellular bacteria and live between our cells in the extracellular space and we're going to go over one of those next so that's chlamydia the obligate pathogen intracellular bacteria now we're going to go through staphylococcus aureus as an opportunistic bacteria so it can live outside of us um, uh, and it doesn't require itself being a pathogen, right? So it doesn't have to be bad for us. It can be good for us. But when it, um, the opportune arises, either because of dose, you've got a huge dose of Staphylococcus aureus, um, or it's figured out a way to hide from your immune system or your immune compromise, it's now got the opportunity to become quite a nasty infection. So how, what's this life cycle? So um, it adheres to uh, an epithelial layer, for example. So here we've got an epithelial layer of host cells. The first thing it does is adhere, and that's using the fimbriac. Um, remember those uh, protein-like processes that stick out? That helps it stick to the uh, epithelial cells there. It will then divide and divide and divide, forming a monolayer of the bacteria. It will then start to cluster, and it will produce a microcolony. And here is a very interesting term. I'm just going to touch on this. Um, and if you're interested in this topic, you should really do a deep dive because it's hugely fascinating. But what happens is the bacteria start to change their extracellular environment, and they produce what's called a biofilm. Now, this biofilm um, creates optimal growing conditions for those bacteria, but it also protects them from our immune system, for example, or the harsh environment. So these biofilms are particularly nasty. They're very hard to get rid of because now the bacteria have created a lovely little house for themselves that we can't penetrate. It can even make it difficult for antibacterials to get in there and to wipe them out. So this biofilm is a very nasty problem that we're really struggling to deal with. Um, and then what will happen is the microcolony will mature and will end up with a massive amount of this uh, bacteria inside that biofilm. And then we can end up with dispersion. That colony can rupture and disperse out and the life cycle can go back round again. So where is this being a disease? Well, this is where it gets interesting. Where do they get the nutrients to do their cell division, to create that biofilm, to expand and become what they are? And we know they're heterotrophs, so they're getting their nutrients from us. How do they get it from us? Because they're not inside the cell like chlamydia. Where do they get their nutrients from? And that's an interesting story. 
Bacteria like Staphylococcus aureus secrete proteins which kill our host cells, um, allowing the bacteria essentially to feast on the molecules inside. And um, what we're actually seeing here is we're seeing in this image here, it's using a microscope that's arguably more powerful than an electron microscope. It's a different kind of microscope, but I don't want to pack you with jargon. Um, we are looking at the membrane of a cell, of one of our cells. This is a membrane of our cells. And it is full to the brim with this bacterial protein designed to kill us. And we can see it's got little holes in it. And that's because these are pore forming proteins. P-O-R-E. They create pores, they create holes in the cell membrane of us causing that cell to pop. Now, one famous one is hemolysin. Now, lyse means to pop. If we lyse a cell, we pop a cell. So that's why it's called lysin. It's a protein that pops. Hemo is derived from hemoglobin, with, and um, hemoglobin is inside red blood cells, and because uh, the hemoglobin allows uh, oxygen to be transferred around our body. Now, inside that hemoglobin is iron. Iron is actually what attracts the oxygen to the hemoglobin um, inside your red blood cells. So bacteria love iron, and they're often iron deficient when an infection is going on. In fact, our body does this clever trick where it sucks up as much iron as it can to try and starve the bacteria. So the bacteria are like, I need some iron. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to produce this protein, hemolysin. And hemolysin is a pore forming protein just like this. And that protein is going to insert itself in the membrane of the red blood cells and pop the red blood cells, spilling its guts, allowing the bacteria to feed on the protein and the iron that has been released from the popped red blood cell. Um, and this is a picture of the molecular structure here. This is super cool. So in the green down here, we've got a phospholipid bilayer of the red blood cell, for example. And in the pink here, we've got that hemolysin. And you can see it's got this lovely hollow in it and it's inserted itself into the membrane. Our molecular structure is beautiful. This is just, it's absolutely gorgeous. But you can see here, they mark the membrane with a blue and a red. So this would be our phospholipid membrane in our red blood cell. And then you can see this tube running through it um, allowing sort of uh, it basically prevents the cell from controlling the water coming in and the ions going out and it causes the, the cell to swell and pop. So it's poked a whole bunch of holes in the cell, it pops, leaking out its protein, leaking out its iron, allowing the Staphylococcus aureus to feed, um, to soak up all those nutrients um, that have been released from those host cells. And that is really how we end up with that sort of uh, bacteria eating away at our skin and our body is that these poor forming toxins are lysing our host cells, creating a soup from which the bacteria can feed, which is super gross. So now that we know how uh, a few really cool mechanisms of how bacteria actually cause disease, which is by killing our cells and feasting on their insides, um, how do we stop them? How do we stop them? So up in the next video, we're going to cover Alexander Fleming and the invention of penicillin as well as um, a few more historical points in there.